Should I give it a couple minutes? <laughs> nope. Uh, it is time to start the broadcast, which I will do right now. You can go live. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Rachel Chaput with the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Region 2, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We also have George Burgos and George Franz on who are providing technical support. I think that they're going to be writing you a few notes about technical stuff into the chat box, so please watch for that. And if that doesn't happen, then we'll let them talk for a couple of minutes. <clears throat> I first want to say that some of you may have attended another Composting for Colleges and Universities webinar that was also sponsored by EPA and held on December 5th last year. That webinar was moderated by my colleague in Region 3, Melissa Pennington, and it dealt with similar topics, but I want to make it clear that today's presentations are not a repeat, but rather are intended to expand upon the material that was presented in the earlier webinar. So we'll go to the next slide. Okay, I need to present this disclaimer, which I'll leave up for a minute so you can read it. And it just says that through this webinar, EPA is not endorsing any particular product or brand or person. <clears throat> the webinar today was developed to support EPA's food recovery challenge. So I'm going to start things off by describing our program to you for a couple of minutes. And then we're going to focus on the O2 compost system at St. John's University in Queens, New York. And to describe that system, we have its originator, Peter Moon of O2 Compost. And then we have Greg Twehus of Compost Works, and he's going to present about the soil science associated with composting. And then last but not least, we'll hear from Tom Goldsmith of St. John's University about how the composting system has enhanced the student's education both in and out of the classroom. We're happy to have so many of you participating. We have 185 people registered. That's really great. I want to welcome you. Today's webinar is 90 minutes in duration, and you can write in questions as they occur to you, but we won't be addressing the questions until all of the speakers are through. We'll try to save the last 15 minutes for answering questions. So let's talk about the food recovery challenge. This slide here, um, this is data from EPA's 2010 MSW report. The Food Recovery Challenge is an EPA partnership program that was started about three years ago. It's completely free, completely voluntary. You may know that, nationally speaking, food is the largest component of municipal solid waste. It comprises 21% of the total waste stream. There's an author named Jonathan Bloom, and he once developed that tidbit into a visual and said that it's enough food waste to fill the Rose Bowl with food every single day. And for those of you who are New York locals, that's about the same as filling Yankee Stadium every day. So this is why EPA has developed a program specifically about food, because it's a huge national problem. And colleges and universities are big producers of food waste. They have dining halls, campus restaurants, sporting venues, you name it. Our program gives you the structure and positive recognition to support your reducing that waste. <clears throat> So here's our food waste recovery hierarchy. Our food recovery challenge is based upon this hierarchy, which was designed from the perspective of preserving natural resources. <clears throat> I want to point out that the first and best strategy to reduce food waste from a conservation standpoint is source reduction, which is up at the top of the hierarchy. Most organizations lack much knowledge of what they're actually throwing away. And source reduction is the first way that you should consider reducing your waste. And incidentally, not only is this strategy the best for the environment, but this can also be a big money saver. And this is why when organizations join our Food Recovery Challenge, we suggest that they consider performing a waste audit if they haven't done so already. A waste audit gives so much information about your waste situation that making changes becomes easy once it's done. So then going down the hierarchy, we have feeding people is next. You probably all know that hunger is a big problem in this country despite our wealth. And the USDA says that almost 15% of US households are food insecure, meaning at some point during the year they're short of food. Many, many colleges and universities have safe food that could be donated to feed people and kept out of the trash. 
there are food pantries and other organizations that are set up to perform this function. I think one of the biggest obstacles to food donation is that many organizations are afraid of liability. They're afraid that after they donate food, somebody's going to claim illness as a result of consuming that food and sue them. So I want to make sure that you're all aware that there is federal legislation in place to protect you from this very possibility. It's called the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act, and it was put in place to make sure that nobody ends up throwing their good food into the trash from a fear of liability. <clears throat> if you store the food properly and you have every reason to believe that it's safe, then you're protected. So going further down the hierarchy, we have feeding animals and industrial uses. These are a little bit less common options. And then we come to composting. Everybody loves composting, and we're focused on composting today because EPA wants to see a lot more composting. But I just want to point out that in terms of the hierarchy here, please make sure that you're investigating the other higher options before you compost what is left at the end. Okay. So I want to very briefly go over the benefits of being in the program. Like I said, you can save money both by reducing your purchasing and also by having to dispose of less trash. You can improve your image, feed hungry people, improve your environment, all no-brainers. Uh, we use an online data management system to track the waste reduction for the food recovery challenge. It's called Retrack Connect, and many people find it very helpful to organize their information and their data in this software. It can make some nice graphics and run reports, and access to that software is completely free. The only requirements for the program are that each year you set a goal for your food waste reduction, and then you report once a year on your progress towards those goals. There's an awards process that we go through each year, and if you meet or exceed your goals, you can be eligible for an award. We do list all the participants on the EPA website, and we do have an opportunity to do case studies, press releases, tweets, and blogs about our partners' activities to give them some recognition. And on the topic of public recognition, I should also mention that if any Region 2 organizations on the line are interested in joining between now and Earth Day, um, we will be doing some sort of an event or press release or some kind of media thing that will be honoring our new participants in some fashion on Earth Day. <clears throat> and Region 2 is New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands. Okay. Uh, within the Food Recovery Challenge, we do also offer technical assistance. You have access to the regional staff, like me, as well as to our Sustainable Materials Management Helpline, which is open five days a week. They can answer your questions about data management and program participation. On our website, which is epa.gov, slash food recovery challenge. I'll be show oh, it's, it's up here and I'll be showing it again at the end. Um, we have a ton of links on that website that are resources that can help you in all aspects of reducing food waste. And we also link from that website to our old archived webinars, like give it a month and this webinar will also be on the website and um, a lot of old webinars that deal with supermarkets and other college webinars and uh, there's a lot of information there. Um, okay, so that's my pitch. There are currently over 100 colleges or universities participating in the Food Recovery Challenge nationwide, but we do want a lot more partners. And if you're interested in participating and you're not located in Region 2, just contact me and I'll set you up. And I should also say that organizations besides colleges and universities are also extremely welcome. So I'd like to move ahead now to our featured speakers. So George, if you can move the presentation over to Peter while I introduce him. Peter Moon is a licensed civil engineer in the state of Washington and currently serves as project manager for all municipal, industrial, and agricultural composting projects there. He is the president of O2 Compost, which is the company that designed the compost system at St. John's University. Welcome, Peter.
computer. Are you on mute? Um, it says that I'm unmuted, so I'm going to go forward. Um, food waste comes in a variety of forms. Uh, you can see here as an example, there's bread, vegetables, off to the left, coffee, fruit, and um, oftentimes uh, uh, the material is very, very wet. And so we need to account for that, uh, that moisture in the material, in the mix. Our objective is to take that and um, produce a finished product that's a high quality value added soil amendment that we can use in gardens and landscaping and, uh, and derive tremendous benefit that Greg will be talking about uh, later on this morning. So taking a look at composting, the secret to composting is oxygen. And with oxygen, we're able to control the process uh, most people think that the composting process requires turning, and in fact, it does not. With aerated static pile composting, we induce airflow into the mix using an electric blower, and that blower operates periodically to induce a breath of fresh air into the mix. And when we do that, um, from here the blower turns on, we replenish the oxygen in the mix to about what we breathe at sea level, or slightly over 20% oxygen level. When the blower turns off, the microorganisms in the mix consume that oxygen very, very quickly, such that within a few minutes, 20 to 30 minutes, we will see the oxygen drop below 8 or 10%. And it's at that point that we consider the mix to be anaerobic. The byproducts of an anaerobic compost system can be highly offensive. Nope. Um, uh, from an odor standpoint. And so our goal is to maintain aerobic conditions. And this is why turning the pile is not particularly effective. As the pile gets older, the oxygen demand goes down and this curve flattens out, but nevertheless it does return to the anaerobic condition in a relatively short period of time. So with aeration, the operator is able to maintain aerobic conditions throughout the compost pile, mitigate impacts from objectionable odors, manage pile temperatures, reduce the loss of nutrients in the system, and expedite the rate of composting such that the majority of composting takes place in the first 30 days. Uh, this is followed by the curing process. We're also able to produce a superior compost product. Um, an, an example of real temperature it looks like this. Once we get the mix prepared and we introduce oxygen, the temperature comes up very, very quickly. Uh, these are these three lines are um, uh, temperature readings from buried temperature thermocouples in the compost system. This being the lowest in the pile, highest in top of the pile. Our goal is to exceed 131 degrees Fahrenheit for a minimum period of three days. And this is we do this in order to um, destroy pathogens in the mix, parasites, and weed seeds as well and produce a, a finished product. This is referred to as a process to further reduce pathogens or PFRP. Compost process is really very simple. We prepare a mix of materials, which I'll discuss here in a moment. We introduce oxygen. The byproducts are water, heat, and carbon dioxide. It does take time, uh, rule of thumb, 30 days to go through the active phase of composting and then some additional time curing to produce stable, com uh, stable compost product 
stable organic matter, minerals, water, and microbes. And it's the microorganisms that are really the magical component to a finished compost. And Greg will be talking more about that here momentarily. So with the compost mix, there are four critical parameters. The first is the nutrient balance, or carbon to nitrogen ratio. Second, porosity, uh, which is the volume of void space in the mix. And this allows us to induce airflow through the process, or through the mix. Uh, we use a simple process a bucket test in the field to determine bulk density and free air space. Third component is moisture content. And this is the most critical, in my opinion. We shoot for a moisture content of 60 to 65 percent, much more than that. And we're filling the void spaces with water and, and inhibiting airflow exchange. And if much less than 50 percent, and the biology of the system simply shuts down, determine this through a simple squeeze test. The fourth par parameter is that we want a homogeneous blend of materials going in. So we want a, a good mix. Uh, the aerated static pile process in a three-bin system, this is a look at the St. John's. We have a blower, a timer here, and a, a valve um, arrangement with manifold to direct the airflow to any one of the three bins. This is the floor of the bin with a aeration plenum. Uh, for distributing the air evenly across the floor. Schematically, it looks like this. These are the walls. These are the two chambers. Air comes in at this point. Over a period of about 30 days, we're filling the, the bin uh, with our mix of materials. I believe that St. John's does this in two batches. And maybe they do it uh, in a week or two weeks uh, to really take advantage of the freshness of that material. After we have filled the bin, we place a cover of finished compost <coughs> excuse me, over the top. This compost is from an earlier batch of materials that have reached temperatures uh, sufficient for PFRP condition. This serves several purposes. It acts as a thermal blanket. It acts uh, for odor control, VOC and ammonia retention, retains nutrients, nitrogen per in particular, vector control for flies and rodents, and it helps retain moisture, plus it, it, it improves the overall aesthetics of the, of, the, um, of the bin system. At that point, we turn the air on. It typically will flow for two minutes or so every half hour. It does cycle on and off 24 hours a day, and during that time, we are not turning it. The temperature in the pile will get quite hot. Um, oftentimes 150, 160 degrees, certainly hot enough to cook in. Our goal is to exceed 131 degrees or 55 degrees Celsius, the equivalent, uh, in all areas of the pile, all the way out to the fringes. And when we do this, you'll see steam coming off the top of the pile when the blower kicks on. During the composting process, you do get quite a bit of volume reduction, typically 25 to 40 percent over the four weeks. In, in a sequence, it looks like this, where you fill the first, top it off. You're filling the second as this one is being uh, aerated. Time goes on. This one reduces in volume. This one finishes. We put a cover on that. We're filling the third one. And then ultimately, we're removing the material from the first bin and so forth. And this way, it becomes a step-by-step -step cyclic process so that we're never um, trying to deal with uh, food waste that has nowhere to go. So looking at university composting uh, in our experience with St. John's University, this is a, a quick look at their system. Tom will be talking quite a bit about that. They had been working with the rocket, which is an in-vessel system. It worked well once they, they figured out the mechanics of it, uh, but it was just not large enough to, uh, to suit their needs at the Queens campus. and so. They have uh, relocated this to one of their other campuses. This is a picture of their system in construction. Here you can see the aeration system being constructed here. They collect food in 30-gallon barrels with uh, tight-fitting lids. And they collect those throughout the week and store them so that they have a once-a-week mix event. Uh, at the end of the system, they have a, a mixing area, solid concrete slab. Here you can see Tom is spreading out the material, the food waste, and so forth. 
comes in with a front end loader and turns it, gets a good mix, and then adds it into the bin here. After about 30 days, the food waste is converted over into a composted product. And here you can see uh, this white fibrous material is a, is a type of fungi that is working on the more resilient forms of carbon. It gives it a really nice, earthy fragrance. And Tom, as you're smelling it, uh, the nose knows. Uh, you can tell a tremendous amount about the quality of a compost simply by the way, it's, uh, the way it smells. It goes into a curing process, simple pile. No aeration is required at this point. And then they have a, a screening apparatus that they constructed for on-site use. They're using a lot of their compost in a pea patch garden, a student-run uh, organic garden. And they've incorporated the curriculum of the university into this. Uh, this is one of their biology professors from on-site. Uh, the thing I like about this is in the sustainability of keeping the food waste on site is they have a group of trained student, comp uh, student coordinators, su sustainability coordinators. And they not only do all the work and help construct the system, but they train each other, uh, the older students uh, training the younger students, so there is a continuation and sustainability throughout that group. Um, to see other examples of compost systems similar to this, you can visit my website, o2compost.com. Contact us. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. And at this point, I'll turn it back over. <laughs> Thank you, Peter, for that excellent presentation. Um, like I said, we're going to wait to take questions till after all the speakers. And George, if you could move the presentation now over to Greg while I introduce him. <clears throat> Greg Tweehus has 37 years of experience working in the agricultural industry. As co-founder of Compost Works, LLC, he works towards helping individuals involved in conventional land care systems transition over to sustainable systems by utilizing products, services, and education. Welcome, Greg. Thank you, Rachel. It's good to be on today. Um, Compost Works was founded in 2007 with my business partner, Peter Schiff Smith. And basically, our, we, when we decided to build this business, we had a struggle finding out um, plenty of good access to good information um, and uh, products. Um, and so during that process, we had a, several communications back and forth and finally said, you know, hey, we'd like to help additional people out. And how would we go about doing this? And that's how we pretty much formed our business based upon our own need, our, our mission for our business um, based upon our own need. And it's basically to help organizations, universities, and institutions, municipalities, and private owners transition from a natural sustainable land care practices, practices utilizing uh, products, services, and education. Um, our basic understanding of, for this uh, presentation today was to show a bi uh, biological symbiotic relationship between plant nutrient uptake and its association with compost. Um, if we take a look at, at what the soil's needs are, we pretty much look at four major areas. We have mycorrhiza, which is basically um, a fungus root, the definition for fungus root. And we know that about 90% of all plants on Earth have a mycorrhizal association. And what that means is basically that um, to help uh, during the nutrient uh, mineralization and uptake for the plant, the, the two um, coexist with one another. Um, the plants will put down exudates saying, hey, I need this kind of nutrient. And in return, mycorrhiza will help mineralize those nutrients that are available in the soil, making it easier for the um, plant to take up. Uh, second um, is fungi. Now, if we remember uh, Peter's analysis of the carbon to nitrogen ratio of being 30 to 1, uh, we know that um, fungi have an important role with um, plant, uh, woody plants or perennial plants in our landscapes. So we know if we're going to make a couple different kinds of compost, uh, if we build a more fungal dominated type compost, we know that we're um, going to be helping out those perennial groups um, much better than 
for working in lawns and landscapes. We move on to protozoa, uh, and uh, it, which it helps with nutrient cycle, uh, cycling process um, by consumption, uh, basically consuming other bacteria in the soil. And then finally, back the bacteria group, and which are our primary organic decomposers, even in the landscape, but, and also your most popular decomposers in um, um, a 30 to 1 um, compost process. So how does this look in a um, living, what we call the living soil or soil food web? Um, if you take a look at the beginning of, of um, the process, it all starts with the sun. And, and through photosynthesis, plants grow. And as they grow, they um, either will um, slough off some root material and or as they mature, they'll have plant material that will um, die and drop back to the soil. And at this layer, there's a decomposition, much similar to composting, taking place without the heat. And that's the food source, or the organic matter, that's going to be feeding the rest of the community in the soil. And as you can see, the scale bro grows up as we move more to the right, uh, all the way up to large mammals. What, you, what is most important in this group is right here in the middle, because even though we do not see the nematodes, we don't see the fungi, we don't see the bacteria, these guys are elemental to the success of the group to the right. And if we were, like the ocean, to remove one component of that hierarchical feeding ladder, um, say plankton, we would see system collapse across the board. And again, that the ability to uh, create nutrients available for plant uptake would be um, compromised, um, much the same as taking plankton out of the sea. OK, what does a healthy compost look like? This is it. It looks, uh, we see a lot of uh, carbon material in here. We also see a lot of dark, rich, humic material in here. Um, although this doesn't look very broken down, there's a lot going on here. We see this white spaghetti type uh, mycorrhizal um, that's the fruiting body of our fungi. But if we were to dive just a little uh, bit inside of this um, with a handful of great looking compost, we would see a, um, a, a thriving world that moving about. And if this slide were active, we would see tremendous amount of activity. Um, this is under 40 magn magnification. And basically what we're looking at here is um, these, this is our active fungi. These, these are the de decomposers of carbon material. And if we take a look, uh, this clear um, material on, um, throughout the slide is a uh, silica. And also, like I said, it would be, if it was moving, we would see a lot of guys, a lot of bigger critters moving around through here. We might even see some nematodes. Um, but this brown area to the right and down here at the bottom, those are clumps of bacteria, tens of thousands of bacteria. And they're probably consuming some organic matter. So this group is in tandem working together to help mineralize uh, materials that, are avail that will make nutrients available in the plant. Now, also, if we see these groups here, these guys play a big role. They're kind of slimy sticking together, they play a big role with um, helping um, uh, mitigate soil erosion problems. Okay, so let's take a look at the data. Um, this is an uh, important tool when we start taking a look at how the quality of our compost. Um, if you take a look at the way this um, analysis is laid out, there's three sections. There's a um, upper section, middle section, and a lower section. Um, if we take a look at what is most important to us, um, we want to know what's alive and how it's going to benefit us. Um, if, if these numbers under um, active bacteria to total bacteria were exceptionally high, we would know that this, this compost would probably be better suited to use in a lawn or annual grasses or um, uh, annual flowers, things like that, whereas um, if we saw the active fungi to total fungi um, more dominant, then we would know that it would be a compost that would be better suited to use with perennial plants, woody plants, um, um, you know, azaleas, uh, rhododendrons, things like that. Uh, then we take a look at our hyphal diameter. We want to know how healthy it is in, of the fungi. And this 2.8 is kind of in the middle of the range. We want to see 2.8 to 3.5, um, knowing that there's good carbon being cycled here. 
moving down to your protozoa, okay, these are the, the guys in the middle that are um, feeding and making um, nutrients available uh, to for the plant roots to take up. And so what these guys, what these uh, flagellates and amoeba are doing is they're processing bacteria. Um, if we see lower numbers of flagellates and amoeba and higher numbers of cilia, then we kind of know that the compost, um, and again, this is, can be done, um, taken on the soil, we know that it's an anaerobic type process. We're going to see higher num numbers, much higher numbers. Um, more associated with like a pond water. The odor will be um, follow more of a, um, of a um, pond water uh, or, or muck around the edge. Um, now, if it's an aerobic type compost or an aerobic soil start, we're going to have that nice earthy smell that Peter was talking about earlier. Okay, then moving over to nematodes. Now, these guys, um, primary, their primary role are predators. And the higher the number of predators we have, the better chance that we have a healthy soil to ward off um, non-beneficials. Again, we with compost, we can, uh, in, in a very diverse group of biology, we can out-compete the predators, making this a sustainable system and not a need to apply conventional methods, uh, much like pesticides and herbicides and things like that. Now, we want to know who these predators are, so over to the right we see um, the benefit of the uh, nematode um, types. And uh, this is important because if we're creating uh, the wrong type of predators, they might in turn start feeding on our plant stock. In this particular case, we have good diversity. You can see many different types. So we're going to have a good result of these, uh, this compost. Uh, finally, at the bottom, we take a look at your total fungi to total bacteria ratios um, all across the board. And it, this is going to be the indicator to tell us uh, what, where this compost is going to be applied. Again, um, a higher fungi count to bacteria ratio is going to tell us that we're going to use this compost um, as a, uh, a perennial um, component. And we can see to the right here also that there's uh, roughly 100, 150 pounds of cycling nitrogen that's available to the plant, which is huge. Um, not using compost in your regimen for um, um, feeding plants um, would require you to go to uh, petrochemical fertilizers and um, to get that kind of nutrient cycling. So you can see ample amount of nitrogen is available for the plant. Okay, we also want to take a look at the chemical analysis. And a chemical analysis is not basically with saying, hey, what, what kind of uh, bad pesticides or anything was take, utilized on this uh, sample. Um, it's basically taking a look at the micro macro minerals that are available for the plant. And in this particular case, this was a soil sample that was taken on campus um, last fall to try and um, see how we can apply our compost. Again, if you take uh, Peter's example of compost, um, all the many different aspects of, of the inputs, we will have a very diverse availability of nutrients. Um, you know, corn is produced in another part of the country uh, as pineapples, and, and each of these plants have a different role in, in their uptake of nutrients. So when we bring that together, that, that, that diverse mixture together, we in turn will get a very diverse mixture of nutrients as well as diverse biology that can go back into the plant scape. Again, keep in mind that as plants grow, they're taking thing, uh, nutrients from the soil, and as we deplete that pro um, that nutrient base, it has to be replenished uh, some way. Okay, some of the major um, micro or ma major nutrients that we want to look at is your NPK, your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And um, although I don't think the nitrogen um, component is in this, um, we do know that nitrogen is readily available uh, in most cases. Um, but more importantly, we want to know is um, the phosphorus and potassium um, abilities of the, of the compost. And if we take a look at this um, uh, soil test, we know that phosphorus is off the charts. And for that particular reason, we want to make sure that our uh, compost that we're applying back to the soil, uh, we understand where the phosphorus uh, nutrient capabilities are because if we over apply then we get into um, um, uh, water there there's some issues with leaching in the soil nutrients leaching in the soil causing um, uh, 
uh, peripheral problems um, in our aquifers and in ponds, lakes, rivers, so forth. Um, so knowing where that is, um, we then we look at our potassium. And we're going to talk a little bit about the benefits of each of these um, as we move on. Um, so let's, moving into our micronutrients, we want to know where calcium, magnesium, sulfur, iron, zinc, and boron. And those are pretty much the basics, um, fundamentals of, of nutrients that we need to know about plants. The rest will come in um, play later. Uh, if you take a look at one that's very deficient, that's sodium, and that's good. And, and um, when we're producing compost, we really want to know where the sodium levels because uh, a lot of times in um, post-consumer compost, we'll see, uh, we could see elemental rise in sodium, which could create additional problems in the soil um, for the plants down the road. Okay, our benefits um, are, I'm sorry. Um, our benefits for um, compost benefits for the soil. We know that um, organic matter is a necessity. Uh, if uh, we talked about the soil food web earlier, um, that organic matter, it all starts with the organic matter. Um, if you take a look, uh, um, oh, I don't think I don't think it's in this slide. There's um, the the we also want to measure um, organic matter in the chemical analysis. And basically what that's going to show us is uh, we want to see that uh, level somewhere in a 3 to 5% range in a lawn and a 5 to 8% you know, like an annual garden or a uh, farming condition. Um, without those, then we're going to see diminished levels of biology in the soil. It's going to require greater volumes of compost to be applied. Um, biological diversity, the benefits versus uh, beneficials versus non-beneficials. Again, we want to out-compete in the soil for uh, problems. Uh, pathogens can be beat by just simply having the right beneficial bacteria in, in, um, uh, in place to have a healthy plant. Uh, water holding capacity. Compost will naturally hold on to two to three times its weight by volume for water. So where does this help? Well, when we get into drought situations like we have out on the west coast where our aquifers are depleted, we want that water, when, when we have a rain cycle, to come down to the surface. We want that organic matter to grab onto that water or that compost, hold on to it, and be able to move it down through um, um, the soil for the plant during tough times. Um, I spoke a little bit about um, erosion mitigation uh, with the biology uh, having that slimy coating and sticking to everything. We want to make sure that the soil particles stay close to their plant root. Um, very diverse biology groups to help with mineralization. Again, mineralization is the breaking down of those nutrients to make them available. Not all nutrients are available to plants, even though they might be represented in the soil. So when we took a look at that chemical analysis earlier, we see that those components are there. However, they might not. Um, be available to the plant. And then soil decompaction. Um, again, various different um, situations. Um, primarily we see it uh, after um, construction. Um, with that, we want to make sure that we can loosen up the soil. And if we took a look, go back to our soil food web again, a lot of uh, diversity in the soil, our earthworms, um, everyone is feeding and working together. They're moving about the soil. They keep that uh, soil light and arable. And um, a good example of that is if you're walking, ever walking across the lawn and it feels really hard, kind of concrete-like, and then all of a sudden you step on a really soft area, that's going to show you there's a lot of biology in that area. The moisture levels are just right. And uh, chances are that that part of the lawn is thriving quite well with air, the peripheral areas suffering. Okay. Let's look at the value of what these um, micronutrients, macronutrients offer to us. Um, nitrogen, um, essential to um, chlorophyll, enzymes, and hormones. Uh, it's also very volatile and leachable. Um, primarily when we take a look at conventional or commercial fertilizers, they're put together with as a byproduct of, pe of petroleum. Um, urea has a high nitrogen uh, percentage. However, it's very volatile. As it moisture hits it, if it's not able to um, be, in, uh, be able to be held in the soil, 
it's lost through water leaving the soil or moving about in the soil, and it also can be um, volatilized into the atmosphere in the form of ammonia. Um, over applying, she can act just like a, a herbicide. Phosphorus, it's great for root development, uh, disease resistance, um, efficient water use, and maximum yield. Uh, potassium, all essential for photo and protein synthesis. It also will help with water efficiency. Again, if these um, um, nutrients are available at um, the proper levels, then we're going to see, um, again, the proper water consumption. We don't have to run our irrigation systems as long. Um, moving into our um, macronutrients, our micronutrients, I'm sorry, uh, we have calcium, uh, which controls movement in and out of the cell walls. Uh, you can see the importance of these things uh, to the plant. The magnesium, essential with chlorophyll component in green plants. It also has interactions with calcium, sulfur, nitrogen. Again, too much of magnesium can interfere with nitrogen uptake. What happens when we have too much nitrogen left in the soil? We have a um, peripheral problem. Um, sulfur, again, it's one of those products that are, are components that are very, it's very soluble. Helps feed our microbes and it helps also building in it with organic matter in the soil. However, if we overapply sulfur, we can start to kill beneficial fungi with it. So we want to be careful again how we apply and take a good look at our chemical analysis when we're making these um, management plans. Okay, iron uh, also instrumental in um, chlorophyll, uh, chlorophyll and uh, photosynthesis. Uh, zinc essential for transforming carbs and into and um, formation of proteins in the plant and we get down to boron um, boron really is as um, is, is micro um, um, amounts that are utilized by boron it really takes a, like a quarter cup per acre per 40 some thousand 43,000 square feet but look at the benefits of having the proper levels of boron it promotes that's the flowers. I mean, we all want a beautiful green plant that we love seeing those flowers on there. Um, fruit yield. Again, who wants an apple tree that can only produce, uh, you know, a handful of apples? Um, and, and we want high quality. When we bite that apple, we want to see fresh, fresh fruit on the end of it. So it's also necessary um, to make sure that these micronutrients are um, available to the plants in the proper levels. Okay. We got this great compost. We've got. We know what our soil sample needs. Now we need uh, some help. And we went last fall. We worked with Tom uh, and, and St. John. Um, uh, had a uh, work day on campus, and um, we took this compost and we did, uh, took a look at the overall plant um, evaluation of the campus. And we really, really uh, realized that boxwoods on campus were kind of suffering a little bit. And there could be a number of different reasons, but when we um, took that uh, soil sample, and that, um, we could tell it it was probably because nutrient cycling. There's a lot of nutrients there. It's the uptake wasn't that good. So w what came into play, first thing we said was, hey, you guys are making great compost. It's full of life. Let's go apply that to these various boxwoods around campus. And so that's exactly what we did. We had a team of uh, several teams of, of um, students and um, some of the help from the facilities teams. And we were able to move this compost um, that was uh, collected and, and processed right on site out, uh, out and around the campus. And you can kind of see in the picture, too, if you take a closer look, you could see that it, although um, it looks uh, kind of late fall, you know, we see the leaves have changed on the trees and the grass is browning. But the boxwoods generally should, um, at this point, still be green. And uh, we're seeing significant browning in this. Okay, so what other benefits? Uh, compost versus uh, versus compost tea. Well, you say what is compost? It's not something you drink, but the plants love it. It's an extraction from exceptional quality compost, and that's exactly what we found that can be produced on campus. Is that we can take a, a small amount of compost, uh, run it through uh, a, a compost tea brewer. You'll see in the next slide, and um, create an environment where we have uh, tenfold the biology and we're able to create a cover much bigger uh, areas of the campus by um, utilizing compost tea. 
compost in general, one cubic yard, will only cover approximately 1,300 square feet at a quarter inch. Um, why would we utilize this in our best management? Again, there's different things. If we need organic matter, then what we need um, is compost. Uh, compost is 30 to 70 percent organic matter in, um, by, by volume. Um, if it's organic matter, then we don't want to apply compost tea. Um, however, if it's biological communities, we can extract that and grow them out in a tea brewer and get um, what we're looking for, give a good quick dose to the plant right away. Um, the benefits of compost, you can see for the soils, um, organic matter. We've talked about that water holding capacity, you know, uh, again, it gets you through those tough times in the late fall uh, with um, when, when we're going through some drought times. Um, it's the living source of uh, diverse biology. It's the only source of, of um, improving the, the health of the soil. Um, and it's an inexpensive source of, of um, nutrients. And again, that collection is based upon um, how diverse the collection is on campus. Um, labor, uh, let's look at the limitations. Labor intensive to apply. Again, I spoke about the uh, uh, ability to only be able to cover about 1,300 square feet. Um, uneven distribution, you know, again, it's a challenge sometimes to get it spread correctly. Uh, you, you can see it's okay to apply it heavy in those um, shrub settings, however, or perennial settings, but when we start getting into applying it to the lawn, we want to make sure we don't have pumping going into the lawn. Otherwise, we're going to be killing back some of the grass will be ch um, growing there. And ultimately what happens is um, some weeds might grow back into the lawn. So we want to make sure we get it spread fair, fairly even. Um, it's restricted by what it can um, give back. Again, if we are only collecting coffee grounds in our resource, then we only know that those nutrients associated with coffee grounds are going to be available for it. So um, a diverse collection around campus is, is very important. And then rain limitations. Again, if we try to put this in uh, this material down during a rain cycle, it, it's we're going to be creating more damage than we are um, helping the plant better in place. On the other hand, if we take a look at compost teas for our soils, um, the benefits, it's less labor intensive. Again, remember I said we could um, uh, brew um, uh, a concentrated compost tea liquid out of about 15 to 20 pounds of high quality type compost. We could apply 20 gallons to the acre. So you can see in a 250 gallon, I'm going to show you in the next slide, uh, a 250 gallon tea brewer, we're going to be able to um, cover a fair amount of land and apply, um, apply the biology where it's most needed. Uh, it's a quick mode of action. Again, it's, it's like taking a, um, uh, taking a plant, identifying its problems and saying, okay, let's get some soluble help right into this plant root system because liquids are um, able to be taken up much faster by plants and along with those liquids, the nutrients. We can also start to put additional biology into soil to outcompete um, problems that might be a building in the soil to, to um, hinder that plant's health. Um, it can be applied to rainy days. You know, again, compost tea is, is a liquid product. Uh, it, really works well on rainy days, and we're not putting big, heavy equipment out there um, trying to spread it. Uh, it's limitations. Um, it's limited to the qual quality of the compost. Uh, we spoke about that. Uh, mandatory cleaning of all equipment, and basically with the compost spreader, um, we don't really have to be so um, 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 so on, on our, on our <laughs> work schedule with uh, cleaning the compost spreader, but when we use compost tea, we really want to be able to clean that material right away because um, it could create uh, additional um, problems by having that uh, water medium to build out those additional biology. Uh, there's no organic matter at all whatsoever. Um, and it's not a compatible with extreme heat. So we generally stop applying compost tea um, in the month of August. 
Okay, so we've talked about that now. So how do we get this compost tea? Um, you can see in the picture on the left, this little crate here uh, with the bars around it, and there's a, a pump here. That's a 275 gallon tote. This is um, what's called a GOT compost tea brewer. And basically what we're doing here is we're, on. if you take a look at the uh, picture to the right, looking down inside there, there's a blower to this blue, uh, blue motor to the right and a blue hose leading over to the, the stainless steel uh, pipes. And in this, um, what we call an extraction bag, we're going to put 15 to 20 pounds of our compost, and we might put some additional soil amendments, depending on what the nutrient needs are of the soil. And we also will put, um, uh, fill this tank um, up to about, uh, oh, within a six inches of the top with water. Now, if we're using municipal water, we want to let that um, blow for about 30 minutes so we can remove the chlorine. Again, the chlorine is put in there for the purpose of uh, giving us healthy drinking water. Um, here we are trying to grow biology. We don't want to adapt that biology that we're um, started to grow uh, from the compost. Um, I, we turn the blower on, and during the process of building the tea, the water will look like a rolling boil. Um, it won't be heated. It will be ambient temperature. Um, ideally around 78 to 80 degrees, and um, what we'll see is we'll start to see is the water will turn brown. And as it turns brown, that's the, the biology and, and a little bit of the small silt being released from the compost into the container. And with that small amount of compost are, are tens of thousands of different bacteria. And what we want to do um, uh, is we want to coax the biology and, and not, not um, really work it very hard in this tank, even though it's turning over and over. And what will happen is the biology will suddenly realize that it's, it's okay to be in this liquid form because there's plenty of oxygen and there's plenty of foods. Uh, we put simple sugars in there if we need to create ba uh, ba bacteria. Um, what I mean by simple sugars, we use a, a non-sulfur um, molasses, uh, and, and we can really explode out those bacteria and, and protozoas, and basically during that cycle then we're going to have a strong nitrogen um, effect that we can give back to the plants that's, that's plant available and it's stable. It's not, um, it's not to, generally it's not leachable. Okay, how do we spray or put the tea? We, we've it takes 24 hours to uh, create compost tea. Um, we have to have specialized equipment to move it. Um, you know, think about it. It's a, it's a living solution. There's a lot of fungi in it. There's a lot of, of uh, bacteria. If we had a, a, a centrifugal pump, um, basically we would be slicing and dicing the compost, the, the living organisms. So in this particular case, we use a, a diaphragm type pump where we're pushing and pulling pushing and pulling. We're not chopping up that fungal uh, strands. We want those guys ready to go to work when they hit the soil. Um, if you look to the right of this picture, we have a cylindrical um, red uh, pump here. And basically, uh, if, if on the previous slide I showed you that we were pumping air into the tank, we want to continue that process. Again, if we didn't have the right amount of oxygen going um, to the biology in the liquid, they would suffocate and die. Um, and then finally, we want to take and be able to move this material where we want. And we have a big, uh, oh, this yellow um, reel to the right. It's about a 300-foot hose that we can um, really get uh, way off the truck. And again, it's, it's a lot easier for us to uh, maneuver this yellow hose around um, to di difficult areas as opposed to take um, big, heavy loads of compost into the lawn. Um, you can see in this picture here, um, out at the front of Compost TE is exceptionally safe. There's no protective gear on Peter's spring. He's standing on top of this wall here. But, you know, he's applying this as a um, fungal-dominated compost. He's applying it into the landscape here. You can see all sorts of perennials. Um, another great benefit here is we have uh, lots of, of uh, mulch down underneath these perennials. And within this group of this mulch, we're using some teas to help um, release nutrients uh, from the carbon, from that mulch, so that, that can, again, we can have good nutrient cycling. And, and look at the health of these plants. They're very green looking. 
Okay. And on my last slide, basically what we're looking at here is um, it, with healthy, diverse soils, um, you can see that um, we're going to have healthy, diverse plants. And by taking a look at this, uh, slide. You can actually see. Look at look at. We have multiple different types of plant groups together. We have a bacteria plant group. You know, this lawn looks very green. It's lush, uh, growing quite well. This beautiful dogwood is is doing quite well. Again, these these two different communities are interacting well. Um, we have annual flowers growing along the edge here. Again, they look really healthy. Look in the backdrop here. We have uh, perennial plants, perennial grasses. Again, so. Uh, the diversity of the landscape is also going to create diversity in the soil um, for benefits, and they all can coexist. And um, it's so important to have a good collection, uh, diverse of, of, of raw inputs going into your compost, so we can have um, uh, good feeding for the you know for the plants that we're trying to uh, maintain. And with that, Rachel, I will pass it back to you. Okay, I hope you guys can hear me because I've been having some very significant technical difficulties over here. Uh, thank you very much, Greg, for that presentation. And again, we're going to hold on questions until the end, until all speakers have finished. We're going to have Tom Goldsmith now to wrap us up. George, would you move everything over to Tom, please? Um, Tom Goldsmith is a St. John's University Physical Plant Administrator. His many responsibilities include the Food Recovery Challenge Program, and he, with student workers, built and operates the O2 compost system on the Queens campus. Tom, why don't you go ahead? Thank you, Rachel. Welcome to the food composting presentation. Subtitle, If You Build It, They Will Come. The word they in the subtitle represents two very distinct communities. The first community was detailed in the previous presentation, and they represent the biology and the animals of the soil food web. These soil food web members come and thrive when the soil is right. Just get rid of that bottom piece. Peter Schmidt from Compost Works once said to me, employing the soil food web will help get the soils out of the emergency room and into the health club. The tools for making the soil right are compost and compost tea, as Greg has told you about. The more compost and compost tea the students and I apply to the campus soils, the more we understand and enjoy contributing to building a natural environment that lets the soil do its job, which is to support the soil food web, which supports plant life. The second community, if you build it, they will come, and they, is the subject of my presentation, and it's about the people, the campus community of students, the faculty, the administrators, staff, and also the community outside who are interested in food waste composting. Let's see if I can proceed down. Okay. Sustainability initiatives blend nicely into university goals such as increasing student involvement, promoting social justice, and responsible use of natural resources. EPA's Food Recovery Challenge, the program, like many EPA voluntary partnerships, provide structure and framework for sustainability initiatives. Their Food Recovery Challenge hierarchy fits well within the St. John's culture. The first priority is to minimize the waste. This is accomplished by the university dining service provider, in this case the Compass Group USA on St. John's campus. They utilize two proprietary tools to accomplish efficient menu planning, food ordering, and tracking the volume of the food trimmings. In planning for a compost project, tracking food trimmings is very useful data. Priority two is to let um, the students get involved in recovering food to feed hungry people. Through the university's visa, VISA, the Vincenzo Institute for Social Action, St. John's students are provided many opportunities for giving back to the community, including feeding hungry people with food recovery and food donations. Now, in an indirect way, food waste 
that ends up as compost used in the organic garden that the students run and operate are, are growth that help the fresh vegetables that are harvested by the students and that are donated along with good food that is recovered to St. John's Bread and Life, their soup kitchen in Brooklyn. These efforts are in the category of service learning for a university. These efforts provide students ways of contributing to making a difference by making positive social action. OK, so who is interested in composting? Well, you are. Thank you for being here today. Uh, there are many groups of people that are interested in recovering food waste for making compost. I'll just mention a few. The, students, the student workers, they never seem to complain about the daily carting of food barrels, of food waste from campus kitchens. And these same workers get a kick out of mixing food waste with wood chips to make compost. University faculty members form learning communities, some of which generate events and hold classes outside the uh, classroom at the compost facility. Give you another one, kitchen staff and you and I don't like to throw food away at home. And this same attitude carries over in the workplace. So it is not a stretch to be able to separate the food waste um, from the trash in the kitchens. Local municipalities know that more organics in the soils provide holding capacity for storm water, which protects natural water resources. New York City enacted Local Law 77 of 2013, which amends its recycling law to include requirements for the Department of Sanitation to test collection systems for organic waste for composting between October 2013 up until July 2015 as a pilot program. And there's really nice results of that. You can find on the, uh, on the New York City uh, Department of Sanitation websites. The university um, also has been written up, and we enjoy uh, some recognition. The US Composting Council publishes a magazine called BioCycle Magazine. And lastly, just for my little talk on the who's interested, the visitors enjoy seeing composting facility and hearing that a university is making compost on site. Next slide. We're really looking at the site now um, as we approach the organic garden. You can see that uh, the students made a sign. And then the organic garden around it, right in back of it, you see the O2 composting system with the green uh, tarp. The compost tea brewing system, you can't detail in this picture, but it's off to the left. And around this same site, there's a native tree arboretum planted in year 2013 on Arbor Day. There's a pollinator garden, and there's a merry garden. So it makes for a nice destination on campus for the faculty, for the students, and for gathering spaces for students in general. On the right, you're going to see some tools for the compost screening. So I'll just get into some of the nuts and bolts here for a second. After you get a finished compost out of the O2 system, uh, depending on what you want to use it for, you're going to shred it and screen it. So raw compost you would use right around the tree beds. And then if you want to put amendments into it and take some of the bigger wood chips out of it, you might run it through a, a shredder, in this case made by Royer. And then what you'll see is the homemade trommel machine uh, right in the same picture. And that's something we made on site with a, an old pipe threading machine and a um, trash basket with a screen. What happens is you throw the compost in the trash basket as it spins. And it dumps down into the walk-behind spreader. That's the blue hopper. And then you can actually walk out and spread the fine compost on the lawns. Moving down here to the next slide, the O2 composting system comes with engineering specifications and drawings, the air system blower equipment, the manual to how to operate it, and terrific technical support from O2 composting. I feel lucky to have been able to incorporate the building products manufactured by Axion International into the O2 composting system. The manufacturer's conventional, si conventional size building products ma are made from 100% recycled material, which is very cool for a sustainability initiative. I was able to incorporate these materials into the most of the entire structure. The photograph on the left, you'll notice 
some uh, the white PVC, and that's the air distribution piping from the fan system, heading towards the aeration floor boxes. And this is a condition before concrete uh, floor was poured. So you see the boxes are uh, air in on the left, and the small PVC on the right is drainage out on the right. You can see the students are engaged, engaged in this pro process. And it was very rewarding for me to be able to help them learn new skills. Students in the right photograph are assembling a steel pipe roofing system, uh, a St. John's original adapted to the O2 composting system also. I'll give you another shot of that right here. What you see here is a black pipe roofing dome system, which is very simple. Standard black pipe was bent around an eight foot diameter plywood form and then set in place at each end of the three bunkers. And related removable horizontal struts between the dome uh, allow uh, a, a tarp to be able to not collapse and keep the rain as it drips off. And I'll show you the tarp a little later. And then those, those pipes are removable so a payloader can get in and raise the bucket. And that's the horizontal pipes are on springs for removable. Moving down, the food waste composting. This is one of my favorite pictures because it shows a happy crew of student workers. These workers are in the middle of a routine food and wood chip mix. They have dumped food waste and coffee grinds on top of wood chips on a concrete mixing apron and are ready for me to come in with the small payloader to give it a good homogeneous mix. Notice a few more things. The roofing system has a custom made green tarp shown partially pulled back. Notice the blue color of the uh, lock and lid drums, the 30 gallon drums that we move compo uh, that we move food waste around in to get campus to get to this site. And notice a four wheel drum dolly. Uh, we really don't truck anything, we move it all by, by hand. So it's pretty common for, to see a student with a lock closed blue barrel walking down campus any time in the afternoon, morning, or even in the evenings. As we, we collect seven days a week from five different kitchens. Let's move down. Composting provides opportunity. Uh, building the compost, opp opportunity came. You know, some faculty, some students, they get some research projects going on, some real data. And uh, Greg showed you some of that in the soil testing previous. Service learning, uh, volunteer hours, as I mentioned, are a great opportunity for students to get involved and learn and give back to the community. An academic service learning project, uh, that site, the garden, and the compost facility has been approved by the university so that um, there's academic service learning credits when a professor requires to get some of that for the class. They can come out to the garden and to the composting facility and learn as they work. The learning communities get together. These faculty members make events. There's co-curricular outside classroom gatherings. There's a student earth club on campus that certainly gets involved in, actually runs the organic garden. And in doing so, they need compost. And we create student jobs on campus. We do an annual service day giving back. and. Mostly we get to train middle school students from the local schools in Queens to come out and understand about gardening and composting. Permit me to read um, something from the quote to the, right, to the right there from Brooke Laurel. I use compost system as a hands-on learning communities event and related to lectures on the value of recycling. And you know, I think perhaps for many of us, composting is really the next step after uh, in recycling. Certainly was for us. Now what do we do with this compost? Well, back to this slide. Um, we take this compost and after figuring out what we need in the soils, as Greg was talking about, we make amendments. We apply it to either the tree, bids, uh, tree beds or a general planting on campuses. We use the raw compost in making compost tea. And we finally screen the compost to put it out onto the lawns and the vegetable garden areas. Now, after we get it screened, the wood chips have a tremendous amount of biology already built into them because they went through the compost, but they didn't fully decompose. So the screened off wood chips get mixed in with the next batch of food to make compost. So just a piece of this uh, quote, 
about uh, what Frank Contalmo, Associate Professor of Biology, has to say. Right in the middle it says, one exciting aspect of the accelerated composting project is that it allows students to take on a project from its infancy to its outcome. This project allows students to exercise critical thinking and invites a whole lot of series of what-if questions while examining the food web cycle. Composting as a teaching tool Right here you see uh, Peter Schmidt giving a class out there next to the Tremel and um, the walk behind spreader. Now this, from, this allows students and groups to come out and visit and actually learn and do some hands-on at the same time. So just one more quote here that I just want to give you uh, a little bit. In my theology class we speak to a theology of the environment and how we do and what we do positive and negative relates to God's gift on the earth to us for which is continual and self-renewing. And Thank you Carol for that quote. My last slide talks about a couple of resources. On the right hand side if you care to read up more about the soil food web I can recommend the, um, the good reading here with straightforward talk teeming with microbes, a gardener's guide to the fo soil food web. Next resource here for us is the St. John's University YouTube. We did a seven minute uh, YouTube on this whole system of uh, organic uh, landscape practices from composting and gardening and being able to harvest the vegetables and giving to St. John's Bread and Life, the soup kitchen in, in Brooklyn. So you can see our seven minute video. And then if you care to see some of the web pages that we have about other sustainability initiatives going on at St. John's, there's a link for you. And if you want more detail, if you ever want to bounce something off of me or need something from me, my information here for contacting me. Rachel, it's all yours. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, and thank you also to Greg and Peter. That concludes today's speakers. And now what remaining time we have left is for questions and answers. And I have to figure out how to do the questions and answers because actually it's not that clear to me. So if any of you other presenters want to bail me Rachel, out here. Rachel, this is George. I have been kind of keeping track of some of those questions. And I would be happy to, uh, uh, to read the questions. And any of the presenters can, uh, can bring an answer. That would so, be great. Okay, the first question, uh, will a copy of these presentations be made available to presenters? Absolutely. It'll take a few weeks or maybe a month to get it up on the website, um, but then you should be able to access this webinar along with the other old webinars from the Food Recovery Challenge website. Okay. Um, could you please repeat the name of the the bill, the legislative bill, uh, that allows schools to, um, to compost food without risk of, um, of being sued. The Good Samaritan Bill, I believe it was? Yeah. Yeah, that wasn't about composting. That was donation to feed hungry people. That was within the context of the Food Recovery Challenge. It's the Bill Emerson Good Samaritan Act. Thank you. Um, there was another question relating to uh, the generation of methane from landfills. Um, and it said, with the White House new focus on methane reduction from landfills, among other sources, has compost entered into the discussion yet from EPA? Would this be a good talking point? Um, this is Peter. It, can you hear me OK, George? Loud and, loud and clear. Peter. OK, perfect. Um, with the method of composting, as I described it, uh, we're, our objective is to maintain aerobic conditions. Uh, methane gas is a byproduct of anaerobic decomposition. And so it's our goal to um, pretty much eliminate the possibility of methane production. You don't entirely eliminate it, it but it's in very, very minor proportions. And in addition to methane, there are other uh, uh, greenhouse gases, volatile organic compounds, that with this method we are retaining in the system and actually digesting 
uh, through the microbiology of the, of the system itself. So it's beneficial in that regard. But we're not generating methane uh, in, in any of our systems. OK, thank you. Uh, there was a question regarding uh, it, the variability uh, of airflow, uh, such as time on, time off. And uh, the question was, are you targeting a temperature and adjusting oxygen to hit that temperature? Can you give examples of how that works? Uh, certainly, that's a great question. Um, and when we induce a small amount of airflow into the system, the biology reacts very uh, aggressively to that oxygen, and their byproduct is heat. The temperature of the pile goes up quite quickly. In order to cool the pile down, we actually increase the airflow to mechanically displace it out of the pile and replace it with more ambient temperature uh, from the air. And so in that way, by controlling the on-off cycle, either increasing or decreasing, we can manage the pile temperature. Now, control is a real strong word that I try to avoid in this situation because when we, for example, have a pile that's running too hot and then increase the airflow, it may take 24 to 48 hours to really see a significant change in temperatures, particularly in a, in a large large compost system. And so we manage the pile temperature by increasing and decreasing. I mentioned that we want piles uh, temperature throughout to be over 131 degrees. That is quite easy in most cases, especially with food waste, because there's so much energy in it. And um, um, we don't want to exceed much over 165 degrees, because then our biology becomes self-limiting. And because compost is so self-insulating, once a pile gets hot, it tends to stay hot. And so we want it down more in the 140 to 550 degree range. I don't get too concerned about it until I see 160, 165 degrees. And just as an example, I have seen piles as hot as 195, um, which leads to a separate question, can these fire, piles catch fire through spontaneous combustion? not with the biology heat alone. It's, a, it's another complex biochemical reaction that takes a very long time. And in the systems, as we've shown here, that's really not a possibility of generating that kind of heat. OK, thank you. Um, question, is fungi introduced, uh, or as we've seen it in the pictures, is it there by chance? This is Greg, George. Generally, if we have a good, diverse uh, input supply of inputs, fungi are represented within the carbon material and can build out from there. Again, if, if we're talking about composting only leaves, most of the time what's going to be uh, the output is, is um, fungi. Uh, we will have very uh, limited amounts of bacteria, which we can reverse around again by just putting uh, foods in the soil. Um, at the same token, if we have a compost that has tends to throw characteristics of higher bacteria outputs, and we know that there are limited amounts of fungi in there, we can put um, foods into the compost kind of like an inoculum to um, help um, uh, you know, invigorate or, or uh, incite them to grow. Sometimes we might put in um, some ground up baby oatmeal um, to start that up. OK, uh, thank you. Um, question, would processing the food waste um, affect the time it takes to decompose? Uh, and would the moisture level uh, tend to be too low so that you had to add additional moisture? I'm, I'm not sure I understand the, the question in terms of the processing. Food waste, in general, tends to be quite wet. There's oftentimes free water in the mix, but also there's intercellular water. So if you take a lettuce, for instance, the cells of the lettuce, once they start breaking down, that water now becomes free. And so most, in most cases, our objective is to add sufficient bulking material so that our mix is not too wet. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Well, I think part of it, uh, I, I read the question as asking whether or not 
um, the the food waste should be shredded or uh, or you know, run through some sort of a processor to uh, come up with a finer mix. It, it's really not necessary. No, the um, once we get a good mix, you saw the bread in there, for instance, and 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 part of our objective here is to keep it as simple as possible for um, for chore efficiency, and. Um, in, in, an, in an extreme example where we're composting whole fish or whole, whole mortalities on a farm, the, the animal or the, the, the protein actually breaks down quite quickly such that in three or four days there's not much evidence of that, uh, of that material to begin with. So I would say that's a step that's really not necessary. Okay, thank you. Uh, what is the weekly volume of waste at St. John's? As far as 30-gallon drums, probably about two and a half per day for seven days a week. Um, each drum can anywhere, weigh anywhere from about 130 to about 170 pounds. If you get a drum of coffee grinds, it'll be up around 225 pounds. And that's why we kept them at 30-gallon 30, uh, 30 drums, because it's just about all you want to be handling with um, a student's uh, to be able to move, uh, you know, and roll things around. So the volume itself is about 3,000, uh, weight-wise, is 3,000 pounds a week in, during the semesters, uh, spring and fall semesters, academic calendar. And then in the summertime, I tried to do it um, the first summer we had it out and, and running, and um, the volume of food was, was just not high enough for me to make it worth, worth our while with all that extra work in the, in the heat of the day during summer. So we mothball the O2 compost system for the summer months and pick it up again um, in the fall. And this way, um, we've got plenty of workers around, and, and they get excited about uh, doing it. We do mix every two weeks. Uh, we could mix every week and layer it in in two sections. But uh, the O2 system, as you've seen, is about six cubic yards uh, in volume times three bunkers. So six cubic yards is just about enough uh, to get the proper um, mix and aeration as Peter has designed it. But it also matches approximately 25 to 26 barrels of food with wood chips in a mixture. We'll fill about a six cubic yard uh, uh, compost bunker and then put about that four or five inches of that finished compost on top for, um, uh, as Peter describes it, um, a nitrogen buffer. Okay, thank you. Um, one caller noted that a speaker said that USCC publishes BioCycle. Um, it was the caller's impression that was not correct. Well, I thought it was the uh, United States Composting Council that uh, publishes BioCycle, but um, pick up BioCycle anyway and you'll see. It, it, okay. it is an independent magazine. It's not through the USCC, although they have a very close working relationship. Oh, thank you for clearing that up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the last two resources that were listed, Tom, I think this one um, relates to your presentation in one of your last slides where there were some, uh, some last resources listed. Uh, last one or two slides, resources. Um, resources as what we get out of it? Um, no, I think informational resources. Oh, informational resources, yes. Um, well, the last slide we talked about the, um, the book that I highly recommend is The Teeming with Microbes, A Gardener's Guide to the Soil Food Web. Um, it's 180 pages, and it's just uh, about pretty much everything we talked about in it today, and easy to read. The second uh, resource, if you want to see the St. John's seven-minute YouTube video, uh, I'll give it to you now. It's www.youtube.com slash user slash STJ and the word sustainability, STJ sustainability. And you'll see two videos there. Pick the one that's organic soils management. Okay, and for, for those that are on the phone, if you did not get that uh, information, remember that we will be posting these on the website. Um, question, what is a merry garden? 
Ah. Well, I wish I knew the best answer to give you. I know the one that uh, I know enough about it. It's um, it's a it's a place to pray. And the Mary Garden is out there at St. John's University as a place for meditation and prayer. Okay. Thank you. Um, what do you do with contaminants, for example, silverware, plastics, etc.? Can you compost meat and dairy through the O2 compost system? Well, I'll give you the straight St. John's for a second, and then Peter, I'm sure, wants sure. to talk more. The St. John's system, um, we get enough uh, without meat, fish, chicken. Uh, we pretty much take everything pre-consumer. Now, pre-consumer at a college university is also the food they don't eat that ends up in the chafing dishes that we're not going to give away to hungry people. For example, a lot of rice, potatoes, uh, pasta. And in addition to those normal uh, food leftovers, there's the trimmings. And the trimmings are from the kitchens. And the first year, we only took the trimmings, which is a lot of fruit, a lot of vegetable trimmings. Uh, and a fair amount of coffee. We have two uh, coffee houses on campus. So realistically, we're taking the fruit, the vegetable, the coffee, and the starches for all we can handle right now with uh, uh, our composting system. We find out we're getting a great product out of that. Peter? Uh, yeah, in terms of meat and dairy, these materials certainly can be composted. It's, it's generally discouraged in backyard composting simply because of uh, animals being attracted to it. But with the O2 compost system, we do get uh, heat uh, very quickly in the system. And I can guarantee any birds or mice or, or critters that might want to dig down in there will get dissuaded very, very quickly when their uh, paws or beaks uh, reach that temperature. And so we find, uh, from a composting standpoint, all those materials will break down and contribute uh, to the composting process. Uh, lots of protein in there, which is a tremendous amount of energy. So we encourage uh, the inclusion of all of those materials in there, provided uh, they are covering it, as I described in, in my presentation, and that they maintain good housekeeping. And one of the things that St. John's does a marvelous job at is cleaning up after themselves so there are no residuals left uh, to attract uh, um, critters or, or any kind of vectors. Well, I think we need to wrap up because it's 327. I want to thank everybody for attending today's webinar. We will be publishing this webinar at a later date, like we said before, after some time for processing. And you will be notified where it is in case you want to revisit it or share it with your colleagues. I want to thank our speakers today, Peter Moon, Greg Tweehus, and Tom Goldsmith. And I also want to thank our technical support, George Burgos and George Franz. And thank you for everybody who registered and attended today's webinar. There's a short survey after the webinar concludes, so I want to ask you to please take an extra minute to fill that survey out, because it helps EPA to design and provide webinars that truly meet your needs. This concludes today's session.